Thank you for joining us this evening. You're now attending the webinar entitled Beyond Just Follow the Science, Concepts and Tools for Teaching Public Health Literacy in the Classroom. Our leader for the session is Nancy Toms, NHC Fellow, Distinguished Professor, Department of History, Stony Brook University. Nancy Toms is the SUNY Distinguished Professor in the Department of History at Stony Brook University. She has written widely on the history of psychiatry, medicine, and public health. Her best known work is The Gospel of Germs, Men, Women, and the Microbe in American Life, 1998. Winner of both the American Association for the History of Medicine's Welsh Medal and the History of Science Society's Davis Prize, and remaking the American patient, How Madison Avenue and Modern Medicine Turned Patients into Consumers. 2016, winner of the 2017 Bancrop Prize. At the National Humanities Center last year, Nancy wor started working on a new project that grew out of a 2022 report she did for the World Health Organization's Regional Office for Europe titled, What are the Historical Roots of the COVID-19 Infodemic? Lessons from the Past. This talk is based on that new work. To our network of teachers, both nationally and internationally, and without further ado, I present to you our scholar and leader for this session, and also a friend of the uh, NHC education program, Nancy Toms. We are honored to have you with us tonight, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Mike. What a great uh, introduction. Thank you for um, having me here, and thanks to all of you for showing up tonight for this talk. Among the most distressing aspects of the recent COVID pandemic has been the easy circulation of false and misleading information about the origins, prevention, and treatment of COVID-19. This pandemic of poppycock, as psychologist Steven Pinker dubbed it, exposed deep flaws in our methods of mass communication during a global public health crisis. What went wrong? Many of us are now trying to sort that out. But if you came tonight hoping I have all the answers, no, I don't. I'm here to have a conversation with you, my fellow educators, about where we go next. How do we turn COVID-19 into a learning opportunity? Tonight, I'm going to share with you some of the ways I've been experimenting with combining perspectives from the information sciences and the neurosciences with historical work on public health messaging during a pandemic. To that end, I mean to critique constructively the saying that all we need to do is, quote, just follow the science, end quote. Which science and which recommendations? Pandemic responses draw on a multiple uh, array of sciences, and integrating their findings is difficult even for scientists. When the disease faced is a brand new viral pathogen, hard data is initially unavailable or fragmentary, and then has to be um, constantly revised as the virus mutates. Certainty about what to do takes time to achieve. And even then, the data may not tell you what the advantages and disadvantages are of specific responses. Does that mean we stop trying to follow the science? No. And I want to be clear at the outset, I respect the methods of modern science, and I am not a vaccine denier. I am an evidence-based humanist. But as someone who has studied public health communication in some depth, I think the mantra to just follow the science is too simplistic. Here's my alternative proposition. We need to learn how to follow the science better. That's a skill set that takes some serious work. Tonight, I'm going to uh, concentrate on the information and communication aspects of that uh, skill set which is where my work has been concentrated, but I think you'll see there are other ways we could extend this. COVID-19 has certainly focused new attention on information-related problems. Too much or the wrong kind of information 
sometimes referred to as a, an infodemic. Okay. I don't think my slides are advancing. Hang on a second. I'm going to keep going. Um, I seem to have lost control of my slide deck. Yay, there we go. Well, okay, that, we're getting there. <laughs> there we go. Uh, always an adventure. Um, so this is uh, uh, the definition of, of an infodemic for the World Health Organization. Too much information, including false or misleading, misleading information in digital and physical environments during a disease outbreak. The study of infodemics is now uh, so important that even historians are getting into it. And my talk tonight reflects this report um, that I and my colleague Manon Perry did for the uh, World, uh, the WHO European um, Division. And I'm proud to say it was the first ever of one of these health evidence network uh, reports written by historians. It also, uh, the talk tonight reflects work that I did last year as a National Humanities uh, Center Fellow. And as part of that work, I have been deep reading in the communication and information sciences. Since the 2010s, there's been a lot of work about these information-related problems. I suggested that you read Claire Wardle's piece, which was written in 2019. Um, and this is uh, the circle graph from that. Uh, these concepts of information, uh, misinformation, disinformation, um, have become household words with COVID. And yet at the science end, there's been remarkably little critical reflection on who decides what goes in which circle. What is information to me could be disinformation to you because we have different values and points of view. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that division play out in living color. For some, messages to wear masks, practice uh, physical distancing, and get vaccinated constituted valuable information. And the fact that those messages came from scientists made them good. But for others, those messages constituted disinformation, unsubstantiated or unneeded messages disregarded because of a, um, um, that were being pushed by experts with a political agenda. I'll give you one concrete example. Was ivermectin, an FDA approval drug for use against parasites, a valuable tool against COVID-19? Clinical trials said no. To me, advocating its use was misinformation and possibly disinformation. For members of my family, it was valuable information disregarded because of a partisan dislike of President Donald Trump. So here we have the dilemma I want to discuss tonight. In a world in which uh, what is truth has become so contested, how do we survive major challenges to our collective survival that require evaluating the trustworthiness of scientific expertise? We start, as I hope to do tonight, by Im improving our educational approach to those issues. We start by breaking, breaking down the component parts of the dilemma and learning more about their origins. And then we try to figure out better alternatives. And that leads me to the mind map for my talk. Um, it's going to be in four parts. We're now doing the overview. We're going to do a second section where we're going to take a deeper look into why it's hard to just follow the science. Uh, science is complicated, media stakeholders amplify some complexities and uncertainties, and finally the audience processes messages um, using um, its own mental shortcuts. Then in, in part three, I am going to use some historical material about the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic to try to gain perspective on controversies around school closures and mask wearing. And then after I've, I've thrown all this material at you, we're gonna have a good discussion at the end about um, how we can do better um, in, in the future. So let's go right, uh, 
uh, well, before we go right into it, let me just say topic three might surprise you. Use history to discuss pandemic poppycock. You may think that's weird. But I can tell you as a historian of medicine that this is a standard element in our bag of educational tricks. We take a current controversy and we go back in time, which allows us to dial down the heat. I've used this strategy as a way to tackle a lot of touchy subjects, doctor-patient relationships, understandings of mental illness. So Exploring the history of a problem helps avoid oversimplification and either or thinking, and that can in turn lower uh, the volume of polarizing discussions. So in that spirit, I'm gonna be throwing a lot at you in the next half an hour. See what you think is useful and uh, tell me at the end what you like, what you want more of, less of, um, and you will be doing me a very uh, great service. So um, let's dig in a little bit more to this uh, topic of misinformation and disinformation. Um, in Wardle's article, um, which was written before COVID, she describes uh, concerns about the multiplying tide of misinformation, disinformation, and what she calls malinformation circulating in what she calls our contemporary information ecosystems. Here's another graphic version of her work where um, you can see how she arrays them by uh, an increasing intent to deceive, uh, moving from unintentional to, un, uh, to intentional efforts to sow falsehoods for personal or financial gain. Depending on how much harm you do, it can, it can become malicious or malinformation. But what's interesting um, to me about this representation is that there's no place in it for the misinformation that results when experts have to change their minds on the basis of new information, which thanks to the pandemic we, are, we have become more familiar with. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, like me, you may be looking at these graphics also in thinking, well, who decides uh, what gets put where on the progression from mis to dis to malinformation? False, again, false or misleading, uh, misleading by whose standards? That, in fact, is a big missing element in a lot of the information science discussions. There's an assumption that what is fact should be obvious to any rational person. Um, but it's not so obvious even to rational people sometimes what the facts are and what they reveal. And that's why we need to dig deeper into how to follow the science better. I'm going to show you one of my absolute favorite images. Um, the DIKW uh, pyramid, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. This is a graphic that originated in 1970s computer science and continues to be used as a way to clarify distinctions among data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Data is more or less raw data as we think of it, statistics and observations. Information is that data shaped into a, a little more, uh, put into a little more context. Um, and then built on that are um, interpretation theories uh, that can be tested and gain more validity. Each step up this pyramid requires more judgment and less mechanical um, interpretation. And um, I don't know how well you can see it, but uh, it's the algorithmic to non-algorithmic um, reflects this, uh, the, the greater um, uh, uh, creativity as, as you go up the pyramid in terms of your, um, your interpretations. Unfortunately, in today's STEM IT-oriented world, having data has become a proxy for knowledge. But is it good data? Given the enormous value uh, seemingly placed today on data collection, I have been shocked to find out from my reading exactly how imperfect many of our big data sets are. There is so much that we do not have good data about. Here's a COVID-related example. With a new virus, it's very important to get accurate data on what groups of people were getting sick at higher rates. Yet many states did not keep records of who got COVID by race. 
So whatever conclusions were derived about race as a factor in vulnerability were based on very imperfect data. But let's say your data is much better. Even using computers to analyze a really good data set does not make its implications for your policy choices crystal clear. The same data can be interpreted different ways. In other words, you can have good data and still not know what it means. COVID really illustrated that general problem. Historians like to say every epidemic reveals the cracks in a community's social foundations and COVID was no exception. And in case you needed reminding about this uncertainty, which you probably didn't, um, I gave you the Kupfer-Schmidt uh, article about why COVID was such a, um, a divisive disease, just to help you uh, recall that time. And here's a, vi a visualization uh, made up of headlines from the Washington Post. There was a, such a sense of dismay over COVID uh, because we think of ourselves as so good at science, and yet this pandemic was so confusing and polarizing. Now, I can tell you that that's been true in the past as well, but there are two factors that made the COVID pandemic especially disruptive. First, it's the first global pandemic since the rise of social media and the acquisition of personal electronic devices by an estimated two thirds of the world's population. 97% of Americans um, uh, have, have a cell phone. Second, the pandemic occurred in the United States during an especially uh, intense period of political polarization and pandemic responses got politicized in new ways. Finally, in um, so-called developed countries, such as the United States, COVID occurred among populations that with very few exceptions had never experienced a serious outbreak of a potentially deadly infectious disease that was easily spread. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is not easily spread by casual contact. It requires more intimate exchanges of semen and blood. Um, so uh, COVID was the first pandemic in a century that really had these um, scary qualities. And all of these characteristics help to make COVID communication very difficult. I'm going to pause here because I know I've just covered a lot of material and um, let my colleague Mike tell me, are there any quick questions? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. for Thank you for pausing. I am uh, in the audience chat now. I'm encouraging uh, the uh, attendees to enter any questions that they have. Uh, we don't have any questions right now in the managed Q&A. Um, I believe they're all in, absorbed. <laughs> and, oh, well. and they're carefully, carefully pay, paying attention and, and, and taking <laughs> notes and you know, okay. also considering the ways that they can translate this to their to their respective awesome. instructional environment. Well, awesome. And, and so, uh, yeah, we are uh, all is well now. And so, okay. Well, I, 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 will, I will keep going and um, I have timed this to leave a lot of time for us to talk at the end. Indeed, right. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, okay, so let me, I'm gonna keep re-showing you my mind map so you can follow me through this uh, maze of information. So I've given you the overview of the, the big ticket uh, concepts and now we're moving on to a deeper look into why it's hard to just follow um, the science. And we're gonna start with science is complicated and has continually to revise itself, but that process can make it seem as if science is broken. Um, first, it's, uh, so uh, why has it been hard to follow the science behind COVID? First, it's hard to follow that science because in fact, there is no one science of pandemics. There are multiple sciences using very different methods and arriving at different insights that have to be integrated. Now this is true of any disease, but when it's a novel disease, a new virus, it takes even longer to figure out what it is, what it's doing, and try to reach a consensus on what to do about it. Uh, I assigned you reflections from the epidemiologist, Caitlin uh, Jettalina, 
uh, to read. I find her insight and honesty about how hard this work is to be very refreshing. Um, she does a very informative blog, which I now subscribe to, and she has really helped me understand the process of uh, scientific um, revision. When it comes to uh, a pandemic-related event, in, in there are, are many sciences at work, and I just made a simple list here of different generators of data, information, and interpretation that were churning out perspectives during COVID, and I can tell you doing the same in many past uh, pandemics as well. Each of these different fields has their own questions and their own methods. A lab scientist, it doesn't work the same way as an epidemiologist. Observing what a virus does in a lab setting is very different from watching what it does to a person dying in a hospital. It is very challenging to integrate and assess all that information from these different areas coming in quickly, especially during a crisis. So if you uh, think back to our pyramid, how you move up that base to get to a feeling of uh, that you have some knowledge that you can act on, um, it takes a while and is difficult. Hence the need for revision. Science is complicated and has to revise itself. Science is self-correcting, but that process can make it seem as if science is doing something wrong. The need for that self-correction can become an unintended source of misinformation. The um, examples of the World Health Organization and Dr. Fauci's early hesitation about masking is a case in point. After getting more information, they changed their minds. They said, mask up, folks. If you have faith in science's power of self-correcting, you say, okay, now we know better. But if you are convinced that scientists don't know what they're doing and that people shouldn't be dying from an infectious disease in the first place, you may interpret that revision as a sign that science is doing something wrong. Of course, none of this information exchange takes place in a vacuum. On the contrary, it gets mediated by a hugely important set of intermediaries distinct from science itself. And that leads me to the second group I'm going to talk about, the media stakeholders, who uh, amplify complexities and controversies for their own reasons. Now, the job of real journalists is to report the news. But since the 1970s, disagreements among scientists, scientists changing their minds, and scientists being influenced by non-scientific factors um, have all become a staple of what counts as news. Um, the result is a very complicated media landscape where different stakeholders compete to get the story, so to speak. Like scientists, the media uh, covering pandemic news is very diverse. There are science journalists committed to explaining science in a careful, evidence-based way. Uh, they did some fabulous work during COVID. But then there are other media actors who are only interested in generating clicks to uh, make their advertisers happy. In communication uh, science, you will see frequent references to the 2017 study from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that I put on um, your resource list. That study found that um, news ranked false by a fact-checking service spread, in their words, fat farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly, in quote, than news shown to be true. Why this is the case, information scientists are still trying to figure out. But the MIT scholars suggested it was because, in their words, people thrive on novelty. Um, in the meantime, our media economy is driven by the willingness of so many media users to click on the crazy stuff and share it. And sadly, it appears that our, um, our attention is more 
easily captured by the weird and the controversial than it is by the peaceful and predictable. And I cannot say I have not been guilty of this myself. But now that brings us to the last subtopic in this in this area. And I'll just note there's a lot of overlap between um, the media and um, the the um, a consumer of that media, as as you'll you'll uh, see um, in a minute. Our clicks are also driving what the media stakeholders then give us more of. Our minds are not blank slates. I doubt this comes as a surprise to you. They are wired physically and psychologically to go along familiar paths. Not all information is created equal in our minds. And here's where neuroscience and cognitive psychology um, uh, has given me some really good insights. Our minds and brains are asked to process a huge volume of inputs every waking minute. As our society has grown more complex, this sorting process has gotten even more challenging. I suggested that you all read Menzer and Hill's article uh, about the attention economy to get a sense of uh, how complicated this process uh, has, has become. Uh, sorry, we are exposed to a flood of inputs 24-7. And thus, we all have to learn to use mental shortcuts to screen and filter all of this incoming information. Hence, we tend to click on and uh, first and believe what fits our pre-existing values and worldview. And that's where we get to um, this uh, graphic, which um, lays out some of the most common shortcuts. They're called heuristics um, in fancier language. Um, but they're, they're kind of well-worn grooves in the way we take in information. Uh, two of the ones here on the chart, the availability heuristic and the confirmation bias, are uh, two habits that, that pop up a lot in discussions of COVID. Um, we all think this way. There's no um, reason to, to um, expect otherwise. But this understanding makes it all the more important for us to do what we're doing here, which is try to understand how this works and become more conscious and reflective of those pre-existing habits and beliefs. And I highly recommend the uh, free resources provided by the School of Thought Org, which is on my uh, webinar uh, resource list. They have a lot of great stuff you can use in the classroom around cognitive biases. So in order to learn how to follow the science better, we all have to slow down and become more thoughtful thinkers. We all need to become slow thinkers, to use a term made famous by the Nobel laureate economist David, uh, Daniel Kahneman. We need to slow think about viruses, why they do what they do, and why we react to them the way we do. And the difference here is between you can think fast about everyday issues, uh, but when you have a serious, complex uh, challenge facing you, you need to slow down and not rely on those shortcuts um, so, so much. This is a good skill set to develop because it will likely not be another century before a major uh, pandemic comes along. New viruses are related to the massive environmental and climate changes happening as we speak. Uh, diseases are moving around in geographic scope as environmental conditions change. Think here of the expansion of mosquito ranges that are bringing a disease like dengue to North America. So this work of slowing down and slow thinking about viruses um, I believe is, is a really, really um, useful set of practices. So I'm going to pause here um, again, Mike, and see if there's any, any burning questions. If they're not burning, we'll just wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We, well, we, we, have, uh, we have a few, and so um, we can take one or two of them, and then uh, we'll move on. Great. Let's do that. Give people a little break. Yes. 
<laughs> good deal, good deal. Well, this one yeah, came in pretty early on from Jennifer. Jennifer's question is, is how long do you think is too long to use that term COVID baby? When it comes to discussing yeah. slow progress in our students in all areas of academics and mental slash social emotional health. Oh, Jennifer, what a great question. <laughs> I don't know, because uh, when I look at a disease like polio and the long-term effects of polio, even on my generation, um, I don't think it's going to be fast. But that question you're asking is is an issue that I think as educators, we we really need to be thinking more rather than than less about because I I I'm I know I'm telling you something you already know the um, developmental and emotional maturity delays that we've seen with with the the COVID uh, year whatever um, they're going to have long term consequences so it's an excellent question and one that we really need to talk more about um, going forward. Good deal. Uh, thank you for that question, Jennifer. We appreciate that. Um, next question is, Is do you think that the media in, in a way helps us help us to not go with what science says on purpose? <laughs> How helpful is media in helping the public decide what they want to believe or use? Mm -hmm. It's, again, a very good question, and I'll say that the more I've learned um, about how media works, um, I had moved away from blaming media for everything. Um, I think we could do a lot if we can help scientists improve the way they communicate, and um, not just scientists, but public health authorities. Um, some of it, I will say, I think is absolutely deliberate. It, it is clearly related to their business model. But I guess the reason I, I don't want to put the black cat on the media entirely is that um, at its best, science reporting is a really, uh, it, it can ally with us. It can ally in this process of learning to slow down and think through complexity. So I don't want to give up on it yet. Um, but I guess I, I have learned more of a respect for how powerful um, it is. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. And uh, we will save the additional questions for the end, but uh, okay. yeah, we're fine to move on. Thanks, Nancy. Okay. Good, good. All right. So we're now, we're now to um, the historical part of my presentation. Um, my idea that virus watching is a project we, we all need to engage uh, in. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to make a pitch to you that history as a humanities discipline is a great vehicle for virus watching and slow thinking. I'm going to quickly share with you some ways you could teach about the World War I influenza pandemic in ways that would advance this project of slow thinking. On my webinar page, I have a whole little mini syllabus um, that you are welcome um, to use. And tonight, I'm just going to walk you through some of the ways you might use the World War I example to address some of the questions that I have raised. Now, there are two really good reasons for working this comparison between the 1918 influenza and COVID. The first reason is simply size. Uh, until COVID-19, the global influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 had been the deadliest of the past century, with 50 to 75 million people dying around the world. Now, you might think AIDS. Uh, has a higher death rate? In fact, no. From 1981 to 2021, the death toll from AIDS is 40 million, making it the second biggest, uh, although, of course, it is still ongoing. And in comparison, COVID is still a distant third, almost 7 million deaths worldwide and over a million in the United States alone. So in terms of 
deadliness, the, the great influenza, as it's called, still uh, has gotten its nickname in the public health world as, quote, the big one. And even though COVID may displace that a little, it's still going to be the big one um, for, for reasons I'm going to lay out. Now, you, we all learned a lot more about the World War I pandemic, including me, during uh, COVID because there was so much attention to it. Um, but I had already gotten interested in um, the 1918 pandemic because of the importance of the 1918-1919 outbreak in pandemic policy planning. Um, it has been an important role model in public health planning since the 1970s. In fact, for over 50 years, public health experts have been an anticipating the return of a 1918-1919 type virus. It was a mutated form of, of the influenza, a new respiratory virus that would spread fast, easily, and have much higher mortality rates than the usual uh, flu. Uh, more specifically, as you'll see, work done by historians on the 1918-1919 pandemic are one reason that when COVID arrived, um, social distancing strategies such as school closures and mask wearing were promoted as holding actions until a vaccine could be developed. Now, let me unpack this a little because it shows it's good to know your history. The terrorist attacks on 9-11 and the bizarre anthrax mailings that occurred in their wake created new concerns about viral diseases as national security problems. Between 2002 and 2007, the federal government spent over $5 billion on efforts to improve the nation's capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to a large-scale public health crisis, including a pandemic. Some of that money went into historical research on the 1918 influenza, in large, in part uh, because of a, of a timely uh, read. In 2004, then President George W. Bush, who was a history major at Yale, read a book by the historian John Barry on the 1918-1919 pandemic. And he was so blown away by the story of what happened that it convinced him to um, invest more in pandemic planning. Um, President Bush wrote, a pandemic is a lot like a forest fire. If caught early, it might be extinguished with limited damage. If allowed to smolder undetected, it can give, it can grow to an inferno that spreads quickly beyond our ability to control it. Now, you might be thinking, well, why worry about the flu when we can make vaccines against it? It's true um, for uh, the normal uh, or seasonal flu strains, it is possible to come up with vaccines pretty quickly, much harder uh, for new mutated variants. And we uh, got incredibly lucky with COVID that the woman scientist who just got the Nobel Prize had perfected the methodology for the new mRNA vaccines um, so that we were able to get COVID vaccines so quickly. So there were um, no flu vaccines in 1918, 1919. Um, there were uh, antibiotics had yet to be um, invented. There were no antiviral diseases. You needed a holding action. Uh, it's kind of in between measures. Um, the uh, term used in public health um, is a very strange one, non-pharmaceutical interventions. It just shows you how dependent we are on pharmaceuticals. Um, that would flatten the curve. Um, and, and sorry, this is just uh, showing you the um, some of uh, the one reason that that this. Uh, um, is such an attention getting um, uh, event because of uh, the loss. This is the, the change in the um, US life expectancy uh, because of, of the flu. Um, the, the idea here for, um, for planning purposes um, was a, in a way to kind of try to replicate what it was like to try to control um, a mutant uh, uh, influenza strain without a, a vaccine. 
um, what could flatten the curve? So for planning purposes, looking back at the public health measures that were used to slow down the 1918-1919 flu seemed like a great natural laboratory for looking at useful NPIs. Suddenly, historians of public health got money to do research on the great influenza. And uh, the fancy name for these studies in policy lingo, lingo are facilitated look back methodologies. Uh, now, why was the, um, the influenza a prime uh, candidate? First of all, the death rates, I've already shown you that. Um, but secondly, again, because there were no drugs, there were no vaccines, um, the only way to slow it down was by using um, what we now call, um, uh, you probably know NPIs as social distancing measures. Uh, that, that's, uh, I think, a more uh, understandable term for the lay people. Um, in 1918-1919, uh, that was all public health officials had. By necessity, their toolkit of measures to slow the disease's spread were things like quarantine, isolation of the sick, school and business closures, restrictions of, of the use of mass transit, and restriction of public gatherings. Um, and uh, this is just one of many of the uh, broadsides from the time period trying to get people um, to be careful to avoid catching the flu. The combination at this time of the relatively slow movement of the influenza pandemic in that era, it could only move as fast as a ship or a train, there were no airplanes yet, meant you literally could see it coming from place to place. Um, by this point, they had telegraph, they had an underwater uh, uh, cable to Europe, they had lots of new print. You literally had the mass media telling you, here it comes, and um, here are the ways people are trying to stop it. This is a newspaper uh, headline from Evanston, Illinois. Um, uh, about the closures of schools, churches, and theaters, because in Illinois, you can see it coming at you from um, the East Coast. So this pattern produced in the United States a series of what we, what we might call natural experiments, where historians could go look at what different communities chose to do and see how it affected mortality rates. If you closed the schools, did you have lower mortality rates? This produced a really important article, probably one of the most cited works by a historian ever. Um, it came from an interdisciplinary team at the University of Michigan, led by the MD, PhD, Howard Markell, who's the first author here. And this was published in 2007 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, and they, uh, their findings presented here suggested strongly that uh, so-called MPIs or social distancing did make a significant difference in reducing flu mortality uh, during the great pandemic. And findings from this, um, this uh, study were incorporated into pandemic planning documents, say, the, of, of the Centers for Disease Control. On your reading list is another example of work that came uh, from the same Michigan team that did the same kind of data analysis specifically for school closures. Um, and uh, you read this article, you can see how they used historical data, again, to suggest that school closures worked to, to uh, mitigate deaths from the influenza. Um, and a lot of this work was being published in 2000, and, uh, or that in 2009, around a time of intense uh, concern about a new influenza variant um, misnamed the Mexican flu. Um, so um, there, there was a lot of interest in this kind of, of work. You also have on your reading list another work that got um, got done out of this whole initiative, which is my own uh, 2010 piece. I was part of a second team of historians invited in to do additional studies. Um, some of my colleagues looked at nursing, others on responses to black and immigrant communities, uh, the search, the unsuccessful search for a vaccine, uh, et cetera. Why did they ask me? They, they asked me because I had written 
this book in 1998, where I talked about uh, what the average American's understanding of contagion was um, at, uh, at the round of the turn of the century. Um, and the, what I call the gospel of germs, which is essentially social distancing methods that people were, had drilled into their heads, um, were uh, the foundation of responses to uh, the pandemic influenza. I am embarrassed to say how little I wrote about that, that uh, the influenza in that book, but I made up for it in this. Um, so my, uh, my job or what the assignment that I gave myself for this um, was to go back and look at the great influenza and look at the way that scientific uncertainty, changing communication technologies, and urban living complicated public health responses to uh, the influenza pandemic in 1918, 1919. Uh, and you'll uh, uh, be um, the sort of thrust of my work was I, I was not uh, disagreeing that these social distancing methods were useful, but I was pointing out the resistance to them and why they didn't work simply uh, because of the changing circumstances of, uh, of everyday life. Now, I discuss in this article that mask wearing uh, was not universally advocated in the 1918 pandemic. Um, at the time, the idea of the general public using masks to avoid a respiratory infection was still very new. Now, you see a lot of people in mass in the 1918 influenza, but they're usually doctors and nurses. There's somebody actually taking care of someone uh, very ill with influenza. Uh, people on the street were, were not routinely um, wearing masks. Uh, throughout most of the United States and public health authorities were not completely convinced they would help that that much. Um, there was more mask wearing adopted in the Western United States, uh, in part because they had more time to look at, at what was coming at them and to try to uh, think ahead. Uh, but again, it was it was inconsistent. And it did not sort of flow over into subsequent public health practice as kind of a, uh, a first uh, order um, strategy that, that you would, um, you would uh, promulgate. In other parts of that 2010 article, I explored the practical reasons that people did not want to go along with what they were being asked to do. They needed to work. Uh, in order to eat and pay the rent. They need, they wanted to relax at the movies. Uh, they had no one to watch their kids at home if uh, the schools were closed. Uh, businesses were reluctant to see, lose re revenue because of closures. I love using cartoons. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, not keeping up with my flow. Um, what I found in my work is, is the, um, the kind of poor man's mask was a handkerchief, that they were much bigger about trying to get people, and I'll say here more explicitly, men. I never saw any propaganda directed at women. It was all at men to cover your, your nose and mouth when, when you cough. Uh, so there was a, uh, a lot of um, uh, attention to using your handkerchief. I had to wonder if this was one reason that my father, who grew up in the aftermath of the influenza, always had a clean uh, hanky. Um, in his pocket. Those are police on the other side in Seattle um, wearing masks. Uh, again, very rare to see uh, anybody other than a doctor or nurse wearing a mask other than uh, in a very few Western cities. Okay, so on to my last um, bit here of, of historical um, material. I love to use cartoons in my work, and this one is really great. Um, the caption at the bottom reads, the experts say, in effect, don't talk to anyone, don't go near anyone, and you are safe, no doubt. But is not this a little difficult? And in fact, they found it a little difficult in 1918 and 1919, and so did we which moves me on now to the last part of our adventure here together is 
trying to wrap all this up into some strategies for doing better in the future. So again, it's not uh, a huge surprise to any of you that things did not go well. Um, all these uh, social distancing methods that I and my historian colleagues thought we were gifting the world, you know, showing how valuable they were, did not, did not um, work out as we expected or as the public health authorities uh, expected as well. Now, in retrospect, you know, Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking, I can see there were some serious problems with that comparison of 1918 with COVID. The first was that flu pandemic blew past fast. Um, it, it was over in most places within six weeks. So you were not asking people to behave differently for more than a month or two. There was a war on and flu compliance was pitched as patriotic in the United States. The economy in 1918 was far less dependent on con consumer spending than it would be by 2020. Um, in 1918, people were not yet as wary of drugs, uh, antibiotics, vaccines, because they didn't have that many of them. Um, and they would only become, become more wary as those pharmaceutical techniques became um uh, more embedded in what modern medicine means and also more related to the modern pharmaceutical industry. And science had not yet become part of what the then modern media covered in, in depth. All um, of these kind of uh, assumptions um, or all of these differences help me understand why my naive expectations that Americans would cheerfully put on masks, take their kids out of school, and practice social distancing in their grocery store because science told them to, um, how naive I was in holding those uh, assumptions. So one function of, of doing a historical com comparison is really to highlight the changes um, that have contributed to um, the, the resistance that we have seen. Now, what's the educational purpose here? It is certainly not to point fingers. My intent here is not to suggest that scientists should ignore history because historians writing about the 1918-1919 flu got some of it, uh, their predictions didn't exactly work. No, my message here is time for self-correction. Um, that we need to widen the process of, of reflecting on what happened and thinking about correcting our assumptions um, and doing this with a broader range of data, information, and knowledge sources. So in essence, I see this as an argument for adding more humanities um, to the STEM mix. And focusing on changes that are needed in both directions. Um, and uh, uh, this is one way, at meaning uh, science, science educators need to change the way they communicate, as well as we need to become more skillful in, um, in, in listening to them. And this is one way that I think of what I'm advocating here as different from the usual uh, literacy approach that often assumes it's only the public that needs the, the literacy um, education. So here's how this might work um, using the action research cycle, which you all may have encountered uh, in your pedagogy. Let's take the topic of school closures. You could explore the history of school closures during the 1918-1919 pandemic and see why it was recommended, uh, Alexa Stern et al, the article that um, I pointed out to you from uh, 2009. And you could use my article to show why some parents resisted it along with other distancing measures. Then you could look at controversies over school closures during COVID. I provided some examples of, of uh, pieces that you could use on my mini uh, syllabus. There is a lot of great material in uh, Anya uh, Comments' new book 
The Stolen Year, which I am reading with a great interest. So you could basically put together a, a, a discussion based on the past and the present to try to work out, um, um, you know, slow down and think through how we might do this better next time. You could do the same with the face mask issue. Explore the history of face masks. It's really interesting. Um, and their use in prior pandemics. I've provided you some uh, interesting items you could use along those lines. Then you could look at the early responses to COVID and the course correction over it. Um, I included an interesting piece by Naomi Oreski saying, um, next time, let's just err on the side of caution and, and tell people to wear masks. There's also been some really interesting work lately um, on cultural differences in the willingness to wear masks. Uh, mask wearing got established as a popular habit in some Asian countries, not because they are, are, more, are, are more docile than Westerners, but because they had experienced the SARS um, uh, pandemic in 2003, um, and they got they got used to wearing masks and saw the utility of of, of masks uh, during that uh, pandemic. There was no SARS in the United States, and hence no prior wearing of masks. Last but not least, and this is important, I put in your toolkit packet. Uh, 2021 study from the British Medical Journal that did a systematic review and meta-analysis that showed mask wearing, hand washing, and physical distancing were all associated with significant reductions in the in incidence of COVID-19. And I point this out because you'll st uh, still occasionally see a study pop up here or there that says uh, mask wearing is not uh, effective not what the vast majority of the literature says. I did throw in to the, um, the toolkit some bonus material on vaccine hesitancy. It was just too much for me to try to throw that in the mix uh, tonight, but I think you could see that that would work well with this kind of approach. In that self-correction, I come back to my, my uh, pyramid, please, please, policymakers, include some inputs from outside STEM fields. Communication and information science people, I'm talking about you now. I have been, um, I, they need more inputs uh, from us in, in their base, different kinds of data and information, and more understanding of the, um, you know, what's in people's minds before this new data comes along. And we definitely need folks like us up at the, the, the less algorithmic uh, parts of this thinking. We need philosophers. We need sociologists. Of course, we need historians um, to help us think about what we do when our data is incomplete, has to be revised, um, et cetera. STEM ed educators need to tell their students, do not grumble about taking that philosophy or history course. I'll admit so far, I have personally been discouraged about what I have seen in policy reactions to COVID, that what I see them doing instead of widening pyramid inputs, they are doubling down on artificial intelligence. Humans are so flawed, bring in the electronic brains. Teach bots to go out, detect bad thinking, and correct the uh, irrational public's false ideas. Um, I am not against AI, but I think it cannot do that service for us. But we do have an opening, and um, there is an awareness in the public health world of the danger of false dichotomies. This is a really interesting article from Escandon et al. that's on your list, and it just shows you the different areas of, of trying to rethink the all or nothing uh, approach that uh, we often have to um, to our, our expert um, advice. I will conclude here with, uh, again, I told you I love cartoons. I love this one. Uh, just, um, uh, you know, how, how are we going to react here? Uh, Alex, I'll take planning for 500. I guess in the end, I, I still believe in planning. Um, but uh, it needs to be planning that's based on um, more uh, thought. And um, I, invite, I invite you all to help me 
on this adventure of starting to slow think about viruses, their history, and uh, what they mean for us as educators. So I'm going to stop there and take questions. Good deal. Good deal. And thank you so much. I have truly enjoyed this evening. I'm going to go back. I'll start from the beginning and see. Um, and some of these you may have already responded to already uh, gone over, but there's one uh, from pretty early on. Historically, how did we do during the COVID pandemic versus previous pandemics and getting uh, accurate mm -hmm. information to mm -hmm. the people? How did we do? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Alan, for asking that question, because one of my not so hidden agendas and what I'm doing is to suggest that we actually did better than we may think at this moment in time. And here's Here's what I'm seeing. The same way that that MIT study suggests that we latch first onto the weird and the crazy, I think in terms of looking at information flows during COVID, that we also have kind of been drawn to the crazy stuff. And the maybe the, the, the part that worked pretty well uh, when you gave it a chance um, we don't pay enough attention to. Uh, I have in my own work done some examples. You'll, uh, I'll, I'll just give you one quick one, Alan, because it's, it's such a good question. Um, I remember seeing in the media coverage this claim that uh, white evangelicals were, were really resistant to vaccines. And this got a lot of media play. And there was a sort of implication that all vaccine hesitation, you know, they were they were at the forefront of this. Um, and when I dug down, I found, in fact, that that um, that really was a misleading um, assumption in that there were only a few of these evangelical pastors that really made anti-vaccination their their cause. And there were quite a lot of them that did not, Franklin Graham uh, being being one of them. Um, and I also found there was this really great outreach. Um, I think it was in part based at Duke in the School of Theology, where they got all of these pastors to sit down and come up with biblical arguments for vaccination and to share them with pastors. And it worked. The pastors uh, were more willing to say from the pulpit, I, I think you ought to do this. Um, and the reads were not nearly as bad as I had first expected them to be. So it's kind of like, uh, I'm hoping in hindsight that we're going to be able to spot the stuff like that that worked well and amplify that. Um, and I kind of like that more than the AI angle, but I, I like people. I like, I, I would like to invest in people more. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on down a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to read through Mabel's uh, question. You may see it down there uh, as well. In our last, uh, in our last webinar, we heard something very valuable about the reality that we simply cannot know everything. I'm wondering, is it safe to say that like COVID or other major news, we can say that even those experts we look to for as much mm -hmm. as their efforts mm -hmm. are to provide the most factual information, the natural course of learning is recognizing errors mm -hmm. or changes and learn from them. Mm -hmm. Hence, the information we get, we must accept and be open to the possibility mm -hmm. that there may be changes along the way. Thank you, Mabel. Mabel, brilliant. Absolutely. And and now I'm, I'm going to uh, have to go back and listen to that webinar. webinar. I, I agree completely. And when you get um, public health people outside uh, an arena where they feel picked at and picked on, they they know that they can't know everything and that they need to revise and that it's hard. It's it's the pressure from the outside um, that that can really um, tr make us uh, feel like they need to reach certainty quicker than they possibly can. So that's one answer. The other answer is Mabel. Something I'm w working on in my own head is that. Um, I think we all need to live with uncertainty 
more graciously and not strike out at the world because it it is uncertain. Um, I I think it, it there's an expectations problem here, um, and I'll just say because I'm I really I was um, a late born child of of elderly. Um, you know, my, my parents were in their 40s when they had me. They grew up with typhoid. They grew up with scarlet fever. Um, they know people who had died from infectious diseases. And that kind of made them, I won't say comfortable with the idea of dying from an infectious disease, but they would never say, oh, my goodness, somebody must have messed up that this is happening. Do you see what I mean? So becoming more comfortable with uncertainty, I think is something we all have have to do. Yes. Great question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And thank you for your response as well. Um, Eric has a question. His question is, as you mentioned mosquitoes bringing viruses to the Northeast. Could the viruses be transmitted by the mass migration at a, um, you know, uh, from different areas into our country? I believe that's the 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 ones I'm talking about have a mosquito as a vector. So if the mosquito doesn't come, um, it's a particular kind of mosquito that um, is not need or did not used to be native, say, to a state like Texas. So unless that mosquito has moved into the range, the fact that some uh, somebody may have moved from um, South America to North America isn't going to make any difference because the missing link is that mosquito. Now, the larger problem that uh, one reason we need to get more more sophisticated about thinking about epidemics in general is movements of population are definitely um, a big factor in why infectious diseases spread, new ones and and old ones. So we do need to think about that. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the um, pre-COVID energy, it's just really difficult to do border surveillance to um, shut down the movement of a new virus really quickly. Uh, It can be hard hard to do. Uh, my guess is that there is going to be more invested in that in, in the future, but it would not help with something like dengue. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, doesn't the public response to COVID recommended measures also point to the critical role political leaders play in influencing sentiment? Sadly, yes. Uh-oh. Sadly, yes. <laughs> Um, you know, this, uh, Carolyn, this is still something I'm trying to wrap my head about, um, because you, I I have been surprised in my studies, the lack of political polarization of past epidemics, um, until you get to AIDS and that's where you can really see it. And in some ways you can say, okay, that, that was, a complicated disease, but it was easy for people to make moral judgments about um, who who got sick. Um, for me, you know, a respiratory disease like COVID, um, it's, it, it's not a, a, a moral issue. Um, and I, I would say I have yet to talk to anyone in the field of public health um, who is not enormously discouraged by what happened. Um, That, you know, I talked about the pandemic planning. Maybe it wasn't perfect, but um, a lot of time and effort had been put into it. And the Bush administration did it and handed it off to the Obama administration. And the Obama administration said, good, this is our pandemic planning and basically didn't fuss with it. Uh, That was not used at all. Uh, when COVID arrived. Um, so um, I just think what a waste of your taxpayer dollars <laughs> that was spent on all this planning, uh, but then we didn't follow the plan. And unfortunately, that um, probably uh, uh, something else we're, we're going to need to learn how to live with. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Ricardo's question, um, 
is the 1918 pandemic still the largest as a percentage of the global population? I I don't think that I can say yes to that, Ricardo, because um, the um, the pandemic influenza is the first one where a number of countries had good enough record keeping that we could know how many people yeah. died. One, you know, I said it could be 50, it could be 75 uh, million with, with that pandemic. It's because we have only discovered recently the, um, the troops coming back from the, uh, the war from Britain and, and France to India brought the flu with them. And there, the uh, pandemic, influenza pandemic in India was horrific. But we don't even know how many people died because their record keeping wasn't good enough. Um, lots of people will point to the bubonic plague, the early modern one, as probably still the biggest in terms of percentage for at least developed nations, but you can make a good argument that the um, epidemics that were spread when the, the European settlers came to North America, um, and it, it was not just um, the uh, Native Americans being uh, and not lacking resistance to these, but also their, um, there was so much war, there was so much disruption of their um, their economic way, their, their way of life, that um, that's a really big number, too. Um, so I usually stick to saying modern time of what we can count, um, why the big one, that is still the big one that gets talked about. Solid. Thank you so much. I believe that may be all of the questions we have for now. Um, and again, I I have to thank you. Um, I've thanked you several times via email, and I've thanked yeah, you for yeah. chatting. But, but just I'll thank you for it. joining us and, yeah. and leading and, and sharing your ex expertise with us as well. I'm sure I, I speak for everyone when I say that we appreciate how you how you guided us in understanding why misinformation and disinformation have become such disruptive forces in our lives, but yeah. also yeah. encouraging us to, to develop. Uh, deeper understandings of public health science and uh, mm -hmm. again just thank you so much and again My thanks pleasure. to everyone thanks to everyone who uh, who joined us this evening yes. again as always I encourage you all to to keep up with all that's happening at the National Humanity Management Center through our various social media feeds to get updates on our uh, activities uh, also uh, if you're so inclined and we encourage you to do so support the humanities education programs uh, we provide that bridge between the academic world and the working classroom. Your gift, no matter how modest, can open up a world of ideas for teachers and rekindle their enthusiasm for the subjects they teach by providing the knowledge and the tool that they and their students need to make a difference. I invite you all to, to join us again uh, in one week, November 21st at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time for native self-representation from mm. social media to reservation dogs. That's November 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, we have Shannon Eplett, who will be here. Shannon from out of Illinois State University. Uh, I can assure you that you all will uh, enjoy this session as much as you have enjoyed this evening with Nancy. As I said before, uh, Nancy is a two-time fellow uh, at the center, uh, but also someone who uh, I've enjoyed speaking with. Uh, Chance uh, talks in the uh, in the hallway, <laughs> yes. it's been in places like that, just always uh, so encouraging, uh, so passionate about your work. So again, and thank you for joining us this evening. Oh, and it's so been a pleasure. And we bonded over Muhammad Ali, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. The, 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 yes, uh, that, um, that's right. Thank you. This has been wow, great. Yeah. Yeah. The photo I have, yeah, the photo yeah. I have on my wall. It's yeah. Hey, yeah. it's still yeah. hanging there. Good, good. <laughs> it's still hanging there. Well, well again, okay. thank you so much. And okay. uh, for all yeah. Yeah, for all of our teachers who are here tonight, uh, I wish you all well until we reconvene again. Um, 
you all are the, the heart of what we do. Uh, we appreciate you so much. We know that um, you all have early mornings and late nights <laughs> where you're doing this great work. And so uh, if I could ever be of assistance to you in any way, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at mwilliams at nationalhumanitycenter.org. Again, you all have a great night. Thank you all for joining us. I just want to see my friends I want to walk the street again But I gotta be patient 